Hello, and thank you for being here with me today on True Crime Edition. If you love true crimes and unsolved cases like I do, then you're at the right channel. Before we get to this case, we want to extend out a heartfelt prayers to the loved ones and the friends of Sarah Everhard. Today's case happened in Southwest London, where there is over 2.8 million souls that live there. With the average of 110 days of rain each year, it can get pretty wet and cold at times, especially in March when this happened on this rainy night. The case of Sarah Everhart. Sarah was born in June 1987. She did live and grew up in York. She was the youngest of three. She has a sister named Katie and a brother named James. Her father is Jeremy. He worked at York University as a professor. Her mother, Sue, had worked in the charity industry. Sarah had went to Fulford School. Then she studied human geography in 2005 at Durham University. Her studies were climate change, political geography, and economic social. She was very well liked by many of the students there. She was a very smart and bright girl. She then had finished and graduated in 2008. Then she had moved to South London where she had a job working as a marketing executive account manager. She moved to Brixton, and this place is very popular among the younger generation for their professions. Her boyfriend, Josh, just lived streets away from her. She had many jobs in marketing. She then got this new job in February of 2021. She was only a few weeks in working at the digital agency Flipside in Holborn. She was a group account director and she was telling everybody how excited she was to start this new job. It was on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. Sarah was 33 years old at the time. Sarah had a friend named Rose, and she lived on Lithwaite Road, on the outskirts of Clantham Common. Rose had attended the same university course as Sarah. Sarah was going to go visit her and have dinner at Rose's house. From what Rose had said to the BBC, they were just talking mostly about the lockdown and how much it had affected them and how boring the days were. Also, Rose had said that Sarah was a great support to her when she had lost her mother, saying, quote, she's really caring, thoughtful, and never had a bad word to say about anyone ever. Sarah had went to her local store first to pick up a bottle of wine. Then she headed over to Rose's house. After dinner and the evening came to a close, she had left Rose's house around 9 p.m. She had left the back gate to walk to the Brixton Hill where she lived. Her home was about a two and a half miles away. It would take her about an hour to arrive at her house, but she had walked this many times before, and she always would take the well-lit route home. Now, Wandsworth was known to be one of the safer neighborhoods in London. She had walked to Pointers Road, and where she is caught on CCTV at Bode Road Junction. She was talking to her boyfriend, Josh, on the phone for about 15 minutes. She told him that she would meet up with him the next following day. She ended the call around 9.28. She was then seen on CCTV again on Cavendish Road. When March 4th had rolled around, she did not show up at her meeting at work. 
Josh, her boyfriend, had tried to get a hold of her throughout the day with no luck, just thinking that she might have just been busy. He had went to the place where they were going to meet up that evening. He had waited, and she did not show up. He tried to call her, got nothing. After waiting for her for a while, he got worried and then he called the police to report her missing. And this was a little after 8 p.m. Her family and friends were getting worried by the minute, not hearing from her and not knowing what had happened to her while she was walking home. An investigation and search had started to look for Sarah. She had been wearing diamond patterned pants, a green raincoat, orange and turquoise shoes, a beanie on, and a mask. Additionally, she had her phone on her, which had been switched off, and also she had her headphones. Leafway Road, um, we know she left about nine o'clock. Um, we are looking at a route back, a potential route back uh, at, to get home in Brixton. We suspect that she would have gone on the South Circular. Uh, it's a natural route back to Brixton, but we're keeping an open mind. That is the last sighting of Sarah. We're obviously also looking into CCTV and exploring that side of things as well. This is of particular concern uh, because it is so out of character and because there has been no contact with Sarah now for three days. We really want to be able to find Sarah and reunite her with her family. I'm urging uh, members of the public to think about back to Wednesday around Clapham, around those roads that I've just said and the surrounding areas. I want them to think if they've seen anything suspicious, look at that image of Sarah, think back to have you seen her. I would also ask people to review their uh, dash cam footage and ring doorbells just to be sure and to contact us straight away if they see anything. Sarah's family are extremely concerned as, as are her friends. March 5th, when the Specialist Crime Unit had became involved in searching for her, they started to search for her where she had crossed the park, looking for any clues, the alleys and streets she might have taken. There was a camera on an estate agent building. It was on the corner of the street she lived on. It did not show any sign of her walking past it. To the investigators, this had meant she did not make it home. There was nothing in her background or past that would indicate anything was wrong in her personal life. Her family had came from York to London to help look for her. They had put up posters everywhere, also handing out flyers to get the message out that she had been missing in hopes that someone would know something. Now at first, the detectives thought there was no foul play involved in her being missing. However, as the days went by, they had revisited that thought that there could have been some kind of foul play. The police had reached out to anyone that had CCTV in the area of where she had come up missing, looking through the cameras and cars and also the dash cam footages. Some had did turn some CCTVs into the police to help find her. To Catherine Goodwin um, leading the investigation into the disappearance of Sarah Everard. Uh, I just wanted to provide you with an update um, into the investigation. It continues at pace. Um, uh, we are currently uh, knocking on doors. We've spoken to over 750 different people and addresses have been visited. Uh, we continue um, to receive hundreds of calls from the public, we received over 100 calls so far um, and follow up the information um, and pursue every line of inquiry that comes out of that. Um, we've reviewed hours of CCTV um, around her movements on the night um, but I, I appeal for people to come forward with more CCTV, particularly um, anyone with a dash cam, for example delivery drivers who may have been driving along Poinders Road um, on the uh, Wednesday at around, um, last Wednesday at around 9.30 at night. Uh, the evidence that you have on your dash cam could be absolutely vital to finding Sarah. Um, we continue to search the area. They had looked through hours of the CCTV footage. They had doorbell cameras and also all the vehicles and buses. They had gone to the route that she might have taken. The detective thought it would be easier to find something or some kind of clue of where she was. During this COVID lockdown, with not a lot of people out and about at this time in 2021, it was right in the middle of COVID-19. They did have regulations still out. 
The detectives knew that the streets would be fairly empty and she'd be easy to see and spot. The detective Harding had said that her decision to not take public transport or get a taxi home, it may have been influenced by the restrictions that were out in place in London at the time due to COVID-19. As time went by, the reaction of her being missing started to get well known everywhere. Her name was trending even on Twitter. The investigators had found some CCTV footage of Sarah walking on the night of the 3rd. At the time, she was only a mile away from home, where she did not make it any further. It was on March 6th that the police had released the CCTV footage in hopes to see if anyone could remember seeing her or maybe get some leads on her whereabouts. Then there was a CCTV footage from a bus that was passing that did show Sarah standing with an unidentified man at the side of the road near a compact car, which had its hazard lights on flashing. It did seem like they were just talking. This was one of the last known sightings of Sarah. At 9.38 p.m., another car had a dash cam footage showing the same car still parked. However, it does show both front doors opened at this time. The police wanted to get the identification of the man who was standing with Sarah the night she disappeared. March 8th, Sarah's boyfriend Josh had went to social media to plead with anyone to help find Sarah to share the post. On March 9th, the search of finding Sarah had been even ramped up more. The efforts was to look along the drains and also along the A205. They were searching the ponds in Clamptham Commons too. That same night, they did make a major announcement. There was a man in Deal Kent had been arrested in his home. To find the man in the dash cam footage, a number plate recognition was to find the car and they did locate it in Dover from a car rental agency. When the investigators went to the car rental agency, they did give them all the details of who had rented the car and also the two numbers that he did give them. When they had put the numbers in the police database, they were all shocked and horrified to know who this man is. He was one of their own, a Metropolitan Police Officer and a Firearms Officer, a Diplomatic Protection Command Officer in 2021. His job was basically to guard different nations and embassies in London. It was 48-year-old Wayne Cousins. The police were in hopes that Sarah would still be alive, maybe being held captive somewhere. So they did an emergency interview without a presence of a solicitor. So we're here to talk to you about Sarah. Do you know Sarah? I don't know. Sarah went missing. Um, I'll show you some pictures of her on the day. Sarah went missing um, on Wednesday. And her parents, obviously, and her family are really worried about that. Yeah. The inquiry that's been conducted so far has led us to come and speak to you about it and to see what you, what you know about Sarah, okay? So, would you like to, do you know where Sarah is? No. Right? Do you know anything about what happened to her? I know that um, she went missing up in um, London somewhere. Um, what, uh, a week ago or so, uh, just from what I've got on the news. Okay. Have you ever personally met No, not personally met Have you had any interactions with her at all? No, uh, why do why, why, why I have personal interactions with her? Well, it's very difficult because I can't go into a lot of the evidence because obviously that would be quite, that's not part of what an urgent interview is, okay? This interview is just about trying to find her. 
Because oh, she's been missing for a while well, now. I'm sat in handcuffs and well, I know her. So you must have something to say that I, I know her. Well, I said, you've been arrested on suspicion of kidnap. And we believe that you've been involved in her disappearance and taking her away from her family. Okay. So we are trying to find her. Obviously, everybody is very worried about her. She's got, you know, parents, she's got, a, you know, she's got a girlfriend. There's a lot of people that care about her. Sure, you see her on the news, and people that have been reaching out, out, out there looking for her every day. And she's missing. And it's our job to find her. Well, I don't think it's our job. I think it's our job to find her. It's our job to find her. It's our job to find her. Okay. Now, we believe that you've been something about where she is and that's why we're here to look for her and to try and find her and that's why we're talking to you now is to try and get you to have a good think about it because anything we can about where we want to find okay um well i am in financial um and i've been um lent on by um i don't know who they are the uh, group, the gang, whatever, um, and they told me why I need to go and pick up girls and get them to them. So um, I said, what's happening? Um, and it then came through that they're going to oh my family, take them away, and they'll use them instead. Um, but at that point, I had no option to try and find somebody. So I don't. Um, there's just a couple of names. I was told a place to um, take her. That's it. That's all. That is all I know. To so this group of people. Without them, I need to find them. Tell me everything you know. That okay. I that you'll have there was a white sprinter van. Um, they. Um, uh, it was in between sort of Lennon and Stone area that I got to off. Um, I still don't know. I, I, I don't know. They, they just, I, I just um, parked my car up and then the van came up behind me, flashed me, and they all jumped out. Um, and then they, they, they took this girl. Uh, um, they said, <clears throat> they said, You've done good, and uh, I don't know whether my family's going to be arrested. But they, they threatened, they threatened to take my family away from me. So at that point, I'm I'm doing what I can to protect my family. That's it. So all I know is that it was a roundabout. We could drive there now. I could show you. But I, I, roughly, I don't know. Lenham made stand every other time. If we did it on Google, if we did it on Google Map, we'd like in real life if we drove it. Right. To do it. I drove from Ashford to Maidstone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a roundabout that breaks up, I guess, so this is the first big roundabout. You come to, and you carry straight over to Maidstone. But instead, I went round that roundabout and back up another road. Um, and at that point, I was flashed and pulled over. Um, so I just got out, um, opened my door, opened that door, and pushed me out against the front of the car, took the girl, drove off. That's it. They said, We'll be in touch. So I'm here, I'm off work with stress because I'm here to protect my family. I want to be here 24 seven for my family. They come from my family. I've got nothing myself. I've got no choice. I'll go back through the room with you in a minute, all right? But how do they contact you? How do you contact them? So, I tried to go on one of their cool girls and rip her off. So she's told them and, um, they, they, they've got me. So, how do they, how do they contact you? How, how is it they've been contacted you to do make these threats? 
they just they just tell me be here, be here. So hotel person down in Brixton could be here. I guess I turned up. Um, I've, got, I've got no mobile number, and they have got my mobile number. They have, they're obviously outside watching, following. I just honestly, how are they telling you to be there? To be there? How is it that they're giving those directions? Yeah, they'll, 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 they'll come outside. So they'll be outside here. Yeah. And then they'll say, "Why are you going to be in Folkestone uh, this time? Or well, you're going to be in Ashford for this time?" But at the same time, being threatened. Um, it had um, Romanian plates on the on the van. Um, He was married to a woman named Elena for over 10 years, and he's a father of two. Before he had become a police officer, he was a mechanic in his family business. He is the eldest of two. He was also in the army services. He had joined the Civil Nuclear Constabulary protecting nuclear power plants. In his late 30s, he did join the forces to become a police officer. He had been arrested on suspicion of kidnapping. Also, a woman had been arrested, and she was in her mid-30s, on suspicion of assisting an offender. She had been released out on bail, and eventually the charges would be later dropped. Following the arrest, he was held in Belmarsh Prison. They had checked up on him every 15 minutes as protocol for the potentially vulnerable prisoners. It was his second night in custody that they found him. He did have head injuries and was unconscious. He had been alone in a cell, and they found out later that the injuries were self-inflicted. After his arrest, many people were stunned and horrified that a trusting police officer had been arrested. On March 10th, the police had begun search in the wooded area by Ashford. Then they searched the house in Deal, where they had taken the family cars and had been seized. Also, they had brought out dog units to search different areas in the buildings. They had got helicopters to search the wider areas in hopes that they could locate Sarah. Even though there was no body found, the police had rearrested Wayne. By this time, it was on suspicion of murder, not just kidnapping. As they looked into Wayne's background more deeply, they did find out in 2019, he had bought a small part of property in Woodland off of Frid Lane. And also they found his cell phone data and had tracked his every movements. This is not the news that Sarah Everard's family wanted to hear. They are said to be distraught that a serving police officer has been arrested on suspicion of kidnap and murder. Now there were significant developments today as detectives moved in on a number of locations in the Kent area, including the woodlands behind me here, where forensic officers have spent the day desperately searching for any clues that may lead them to the missing 33-year-old. Now, just to give you a sense of the scale of this operation, they had already searched 750 homes in the London area before honing in on one particular address in the town of Deal. This had the police interest in searching for Sarah Then around 5 p.m. the same day, they did find a gruesome sight. The search for Sarah had come to a sad and tragic end. This evening, detectives and search teams investigating Sarah's disappearance have found, very sadly, what appears to be human remains. And some breaking news to bring you this hour. In the last few moments, it's been confirmed that the Duchess of Cambridge has been at the bandstand on Clapham Common, taking a look at the flowers and the tributes that have been laid in memory of the missing and abducted Sarah Everard. You can see her there in the green coat, just taking a moment like so many women have to pause and reflect and remember. They had found human remains, and using the dental records, they did find out it was indeed Sarah's body that they found. A vigil for Sarah had been set up on March 13th. It was that Saturday the reclaimed the streets, who did organize a vigil, had said that the police refused to help them organize it safely. 
With COVID-19 protocols in place, the police said that the organizers would be liable for fines of 10,000 pounds each. And that would be over 11,000 US dollars for each if the vigil continued. They had no option but to cancel it. However, some others had went to Clamtam Common to pay their respects and also to make aware of violence against women. At first, the vigil was calm, but then later, the police had attempted to disperse the crowd because of them being at the bandstand, which was the center of the vigil. Did not take long when the police and the ones tending the vigil started to get heated up in arguments, which then turned into many getting arrested for public order offenses and breaching of the health protection regulations. Worth saying, um, of course, I fully understand the strength of feeling, I think, uh, as a woman and hearing from people about their experiences in the past and what they feel about uh, what happened to Sarah and what has been going on. I understand why so many people wanted to come and pay their respects and uh, kind of make a statement about this. Indeed, if it had been lawful, I'd have been there. I'd have been at a vigil. Six hours of yesterday was really calm and peaceful. Very few police officers around, respectful people laying flowers, uh, not gathering, uh, and you know a, a, a vigil that did not breach the regulations. Uh, unfortunately, later on, uh, we had a really big crowd that gathered, lots of speeches, uh, and. Uh, Quite rightly, as far as I can see, my team felt this is now an unlawful gathering uh, which poses a considerable risk to people's health, uh, according to the regulations. Uh, a really invidious position for my officers to find themselves in, um, but they then moved to try to explain to people, to engage with people, to get people to disperse from this unlawful gathering, and many, many, many people did. Unfortunately, a small minority did not. While in custody, Wayne, he again, was taken to the hospital with head injuries for the second time. Then, a few hours later, he was officially charged with the kidnap and murder of Sarah. The senior coroner had said that the pathologist had not given a medical cause to the death of Sarah. She was able to confirm that there was no natural disease which was found that could have caused her death and the tests would still continue to find out what she did die of. Then later, it was determined that she had been raped. The cause of her death was compression to the neck and strangled by a police belt. It was on May 22nd that Sarah was laid to rest. The funeral was held at the Hesington Church in York. The family and friends had come together to remember her life and to honor her. On March 3rd, when Sarah had came up missing, Wayne, he had just finished a 12-hour shift guarding the U.S. Embassy. He had been linked to many claims that he did acts of indecent exposure. One that did happen in 2015 in Kent, the latest was three days before Sarah had came up missing in London. Now, according to the records, it was reported to the police, but the police never did follow up on those claims. It was also found out when he was in the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, his nickname was The Rapist. In the investigation, they had found out that Wayne had left London in the hours after Sarah had come up missing. He was in Tilsington, Kent. He was there in the early morning hours. At 8.30 in the morning, he returned the car rental. It was soon that everyone would find out what he truly had done that night to Sarah, which was horrifying. The prosecution has said what had happened leading up to the days of Sarah's murder. On February 10th, he had gone on Amazon. He had ordered a police standard handcuff key with a double locking pin. 
On February 28th, he had rented a white Vauxhall Astra at the car rental agency. He did give them his ID, his address, and his phone number. He had went to the store and bought a self-adhesive carpet protector. He then did his regular shift on March 2nd. He had finished up at 7 a.m. on March 3rd. Then he drove back home to Kent where he had picked up this car rental at 4.45. Then he drove back to London. At 8 p.m., he had went into the store and bought a packet of hair bands. The police had suspected that it was for the purpose for the kidnap or rape even used in a sex act or restraints. He then had drove around looking for a lone young female walking the streets to kidnap and rape. This is when he had stopped Sarah on Pointers Road. As she was walking home, he did wear his police belt and he had used his warrant card to arrest her under the false accusations of her breaching COVID-19 restriction guidelines. At the time of Sarah's arrest, a woman who was a passenger in a car had been passing by and she said she saw Sarah being arrested and handcuffed, that her head was down and she was compliant. Then he had put her in the back seat of his car rental and then he drove off. When he had reached Kent, he had switched from the car rental to his own car. He then had drove her to a secluded area where he had raped her in the back seat. And after that, he had taken his belt off and he strangled her to death. He then had dumped her body in the woodland area that he did own in Hood's Wood. It was near Ashford, Kent. Everything was being tracked by his phone. It was the next morning that he went out to a Costa coffee shop. He had bought a tart and a cup of coffee. You could see he does look a little bit nervous and fidgety at the till. Then about 8.30, March 4th, he had returned the car rental that he had driven over 300 miles in it. He then had disposed of Sarah's phone in the river in Sandwich, Kent was at 11.05 in the morning. He had went to a gas station in Dover. He had bought a gas can and he had filled it up and also his tank. He had then headed over to McDonald's for some food. The police believed he had went back to where Sarah's body was to attempt to burn Sarah's body. It was in a refrigerator on his property. At 12.40 p.m., a fire was seen in Hood's Wood. Also, his car had been seen by there by witnesses. Unsuccessfully burning her, he then had went to the pond that was on his property and dumped her body in it. There was a piece of SIM card that they found in his back of the car seat, also bloodstains, and his semen. The bloodstains matched Sarah's DNA. This had linked him even more to her murder. Now, to put a quick pause on what he had done to Sarah, let me tell you a little bit more about his demeanor. Just picture this, less than 24 hours after he killed Sarah, he had called the vet because he was afraid his puppy was having separation anxiety and he scheduled an appointment. Yeah, I was wondering if I could book my um, dog in for the uh, for the vet so I can have a discussion about her issues, please. She, well, we think she's suffering from, like, separation anxiety. Oh, my God. He then also called into work and said that he was not feeling good and suffering from stress. All along, his movements were being recorded on CCTV in Dover. He had went to Big Q store buying two large green bags before he had went back to Hodes Wood. This is believed that he had used them to move Sarah's body into the pond. On March 7th, he had taken his family out to the very same spot that he had murdered Sarah, dumped her body in Hodes Woods at the pond. He had allowed his kids to play right near where her body was. He was to return to work on March 8th, but instead he had called in sick. Then on March 9th is when the police had been tracking his every movements and they came upon his doorstep 
Now, about 40 minutes before the police had come knocking, he did wipe his phone out completely. He had been arrested and charged for the kidnap, rape, and murder of Sarah. It was during the first court appearance in September of 2021 that Sarah's family had watched remotely. Wayne had a wound on his head and had rocked back and forth, and all he ever said was his name, address, and his birthday. He remained in custody. In the court hearing, it was said that he was known to wear his police belt even when he was not on duty. Then on September 30th, he was given life sentence, never to be freed again to hurt anyone else. With this being a high-profile case, it was well known all around the world. Many were worried about women and the violence toward them. A frustration for women everywhere that the burden has been placed on us to stay safe rather than compelling men to change their behavior. Her murder sparking a movement, a collective sense of grief, fear, and anger in women around the world. Police had went knocking on the doors to tell women to stay home for their safety after Sarah had come up reported missing. This had angered many women. They were putting the blame on them instead of doing something about the problem at hand. And rightly so. What happened to Sarah did not look good at all to, for the police. One, he was a cop. And two, the history of them not looking into the claims of indecent exposure filed against Wayne. This watchdog, the IOPC, is investigating why nothing came of the earlier allegations against cousins. Why police took no action. Ten officers faced misconduct charges. And let's not forget the vigil incident. They had told the women that if they're being stopped by a lone officer, if you do not feel comfortable, they flag down a passerby or knock on someone's door. Then dial 999. My son's girlfriend is, say, approached by what, uh, who claims to be uh, an undercover officer as she's walking home tomorrow. What do I tell her to do? Well, the first thing to say is officers rarely deploy singly. Um, but if anybody has any doubts about a police officer, um, then obviously they are uh, they should re question the officer about uh, their what they're doing and why they're doing it. If there are any doubts at all, they should ask to either speak to the control room using the officer's radio, or if in doubt, call 999 and ask a question um you know the the, the but what sort of society have we come to mr mott has where we are so doubting somebody who says they're a police officer that we think that we have to dial 999 to check absolutely no that there are those who feel their trust in us is shaken i recognize that for some people a precious bond of trust has been damaged our dedication to you our public remains undiminished. As Commissioner, I will do everything in my power to ensure we learn any lessons. I know that what happened to Sarah and indeed what has happened to other women in London and beyond in recent times has raised important questions about women's safety. Here in the Met, I commit to keep working with others to improve women's safety and reduce the fear of violence. There are no words that can fully express the fury and overwhelming sadness that we all feel about what happened to Sarah. I am so sorry. With all what was said and done, or not done, by the police, this did take a toll on the police department, and the commander Dick had resigned, even though she said she wouldn't, due to the mayor of London saying she did not do enough to tackle the string of scandals. Last week I made clear to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, the scale of the change, I believe, is urgently required to rebuild the trust and confidence of Londoners in the Met and to root out the racism, 
sexism, homophobia, bullying, discrimination, and misogyny that still exists. I am not satisfied with the Commissioner's response. On being informed of this, Dame Cressida Dick has offered her resignation, which I have accepted. It is quite clear that the Mayor no longer has sufficient confidence in my leadership of the Metropolitan Police Service for me to continue as Commissioner. He has left me no choice but to step aside. I say this with deep sadness and regret. The murder of Sarah Everard and many other awful cases recently have, I know, damaged confidence in this fantastic police service. There is much to do. And I know that the Met has turned its full attention to rebuilding trust and confidence and to raising our standards. I am very optimistic for the future of the Met and for London. Was an anniversary of Sarah's disappearance that they did have a walk that was organized by the Urban Angels. It was in the memory of those who were taken by gender-based violence. The walk started in Clampham North Station and ended up at the bandstand of Clampham Common. It marked where the first vigil was held. The purpose of the event is to give the community an opportunity, give the community an opportunity to come together to com commemorate all victims of gendered violence um, and also pay respects to and remember those women that have lost their lives. In August of 2022, those who were arrested in the vigil that they would not face any prosecution, as the Crown Prosecution Service has said it was not in the public's interest. Wayne had appealed, however, it was denied. The second concerns Wayne Cousins, who pleaded guilty to kidnap and rape of Sarah Everard, and later he pleaded guilty to her murder. On the 30th of September 2021, he was sentenced to imprisonment for life for the murder with a whole life order. No separate penalty was imposed for the offences of kidnapping and rape. Cousins seeks leave to appeal against sentence. In his case, we grant leave to appeal against sentence but dismiss the appeal. Although the circumstances of his case do not fall within the terms of the statutory provision, which provides that a whole life order should be the normal starting point, the individual facts are such that the judge was entitled exceptionally to impose a whole life order. That concludes this short hearing. The damage that the case caused in London had hurt many people. It was hard to fathom it. With what had happened, it had changed everything. The trust for the police department, that they were now have to rebuild that trust, and it was gonna take a long time to be restored. The family and friends of Sarah are now trying to cope with a loss of her being gone. She was one of those who'd bring a smile to your face and be a support if you are ever hurting. She had so much to offer, but it was taken from one that she had trusted and believed was to protect her. Well, this is it for this case today, guys. Thank you so much for being here with me. Until next time, you guys take care.